the Lord God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion upon whom I will have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. We begin this morning by singing hymn number 671. 671, Sovereign Grace and Love Abounding Over Sin and Death and Hell. Number 671. Well, as we sit together, let's pray. We bow before you gladly, O Lord, a God who is sovereign, and yet the God who is our Savior, because our misery is met with your great mercy, great mercy, wide as the ocean deep as the deepest sea, and so great enough to find and, and to encompass any and every one who calls out to you, every one asking for help, every one seeking your face, every one knocking at the door of your kingdom of love. How we thank you, O God our Father, for your sovereign grace and love, abounding, abounding over sin and death and hell itself, so that none need ever miss out on the wonder, the wonder of feasting at your table, the wonder of being a part and a member of the kingdom that shall never end. Help us, Lord, we pray, to ponder this love 
so great, so rich, so free, and never ever to scorn or to reject it, neither consciously by resisting and rejecting your call of grace upon our lives, nor even unconsciously, lest by neglect of Christ's call to discipleship, to follow him on his road, we should drift away from him unthinkingly and live forgetful of our purpose and forgetful of your direction upon our lives. How weak we are, Lord. How sorely tempted, how easily tempted by the evil one. Guard us from him, we pray. Keep us from his his tentacles that would love to drag us down, love to drag us away from you. Hold us, we pray, in your firm hand. Hold us in your loving discipline. Tether us in heart and mind and body and soul. Tether us by your word. And so keep us in eternal life. Keep us, we pray, that we might indeed be for the praise of your glorious grace as you have created us and called us to be. That we might bring glory to the name of Christ our Savior. And that we might find in him the joy, the honor, the delight, the comfort that your kingdom alone can bring for which kingdom you have come to offer to us and to grant to us in your sovereign grace and mercy. So hear us, Lord, in this our morning prayer. Keep us, we pray, in everlasting life. For we ask it through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome indeed to all of you this morning, and uh, very especially if you're visiting with us here, if it's your first time, then let me welcome you particularly, whether you're up here or whether uh, you're downstairs. I hope you can see and hear us, and uh, we look forward to meeting you uh, at the end of the service. Can I draw your attention to these sheets? Uh, you should have one on your seat or uh, in your hymn book or somewhere, and uh, it gives you all the information you need for the life of the church in the coming week. A uh, number of things this week to uh, point up to you. Uh, after the Easter break, our various small groups get underway again this week. On Wednesdays, uh, there's Disciple, uh, a follow-on uh, course for those who are uh, perhaps recently have, having done Christianity Explored or perhaps new to the Christian faith or maybe just wanting to uh, brush up on these things. Uh, that's uh, here. Uh, and also there are the other small groups happening also here and around the city. If you'd like more information about those, there are cards at reception uh, or you can speak to me or to one of the church staff. Thursday, uh, release the word and the international's work begins again. And uh, you'll see on the right-hand side in the box on Friday at 7.30 here, our next course, Christianity Explored, begins. Again, that's an opportunity uh, for people to look through the basics of the Christian faith, examining the source material. That is one of the very earliest uh, accounts uh, of the life and the works of Jesus Christ, Mark's Gospel, one of the oldest and best attested historical documents in the world. Uh, and uh, it's an opportunity for you to look through that with others, to ask all the questions you want, uh, and to seek the truth. So we'd love to invite you to that. We'd love you to come uh, and bring a friend. And uh, it begins Friday, 7.30. And again, there are cards and details of those at reception. Just one other thing, the very last uh, event at the bottom there on the right-hand side, you'll see on the 9th of May, um, there's a teaching day from Cornhill. That's aimed at anybody, really, who is involved in Bible teaching anywhere. So that could be uh, in church small groups. It could be uh, occasional preaching. It could be that you're going to work uh, this summer in a mission or a camp for the first time or perhaps just go back. Well, here's a day uh, to refresh your skills, to open the Bibles together, and to uh, focus on uh, how to teach the Word properly. So there are cards and details uh, for those, and I think you can book online also. So do put that in your diary uh, and come along. 
I'll leave you to read the rest of these and uh, digest them at your leisure. We're going to turn now to our Bible reading for this morning. And uh, we're back in Luke's Gospel at chapter 13. And uh, you'll see that's page 873 if you have one of our uh, church visitors' Bibles. Page 873 and... Luke's Gospel, chapter 13 and verse 22. Just before you uh, read there, turn over a few pages to Luke chapter 17 at verse 11. You'll see there, verse 11, it begins with the words, On the way to Jerusalem. Look back now to Luke 13 and verse 22. As he went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. That's one of Luke's little marker posts, right at the very beginning of the gospel. Remember, Luke tells us he's written a carefully ordered account. And if you read through Luke and then the book of Acts, which is the second part of uh, Luke's work, you'll find it is indeed a carefully ordered account. And uh, Luke didn't have bold type and uh, numbered paragraphs like we have today in our books and uh, papers and things, but uh, he did put in marker posts so that we could see his ordering. And here's two more of them, chapter 13 at verse 22 and chapter 17 at verse 11. And that tells us that in between those two marker points is Luke's next section of teaching. And therefore, we should be looking and expecting that it would all hang together with some kind of similar theme, some similar concerns. And indeed, over the next uh, three or four weeks, that's what we'll be looking at and that's what we shall indeed discover. But we're going to read the first section of that teaching now, which is from verse 22 to the end of chapter 13. Jesus went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, You strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you'll begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some who are last, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day. I finish my course Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house, the temple, is forsaken. And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. May God bless to us this, his word. Well, verse 29 tells us there that people will come from east and west and north and south and recline at the great banqueting feast in the kingdom of God. And our next hymn reminds us of the wideness of God's great mercy. Number 251, there's a wideness in God's mercy that is wider than the greatest sea, and so I know it covers even me. 
And we'll sing this uh, little song through twice. Number 251. Well, well, now as our uh, musicians play quietly, our offerings for the Lord's work will be received. You might like to use the time to read again these words we'll be studying shortly, or perhaps just to pray quietly for those in need at this time. But as we do that, our offerings are received. Thank you. 
Let's pray together again. Our Heavenly Father, our minds and our hearts turn to this, your world, a world that we love because it is a world you so loved that you sent your only begotten Son to be the Savior of everyone who believes. And as we read of some of the terrible tragedies this week, yet another one just in this last day of a boat capsizing in the Mediterranean Sea, losing hundreds of people, seeking to flee from the conflict and the oppression and the terror of some of the situations in North Africa and the Middle East. Our hearts grieve, O oh Lord, for the loss of human life and for the tragic circumstances that would send hundreds of people to crowd into tiny boats and seek a way across the ocean because of a vague and, and vain hope often of freedom and liberty and a new life. Lord, we think of the land of Libya now right off our television screens and news after all the events that transpired there a couple of years ago. We pray for the many who have been dispossessed who now live in chaos and in fear, fleeing the country, seeking peace and seeking havens in other countries, and yet so many of the surrounding nations having experienced the so-called Arab Spring of New Hope have been plunged instead into, it seems, a never-ending winter of despair and of darkness. We think of continuing reports from Syria and the use again, it seems, of these dreadful chemical weapons against the varying and different sides in that civil war. Now so complicated, few of us can understand the rights and the wrongs. It seems there are few rights and nearly all wrongs. Lord, we don't have the wisdom to know what to ask, but we have care and compassion in our hearts, and we come to you and to your throne of grace, your throne of justice and power. We lay before you these concerns and ask that there might be, through the ordained powers and authorities that rule in this world only under your sovereign command, not without your permission, it is your power given and delegated into the hands of men that rule our world, even where it is corrupted, sometimes to a frightening and devastating degree. But we pray, Lord, for the powers that hold sway in our world, very especially through those agencies seeking to bring a measure of justice and righteousness and peace, at least. We think of the ongoing negotiations with Iran concerning their nuclear developments and pretensions. We know all the fears and distrust surrounding that. But we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give wisdom and that those seeking security and peace would not be sold something that is merely lies and deception, but that there would be a way, indeed, to genuinely reducing the threats of war and of calamity in the Middle East. We pray for Syria, for the ongoing fallout of all the near genocide that has been happening there, for the many ongoing conflicts in Israel and Palestine, and the inexorable march, it seems, of the Islamic State across that whole area of Iraq and the Levant. Lord, give wisdom to those who have power in their hands. Give a heart for mercy, we pray, to those who have it in their power to devastate the lives of countless thousands, even millions. Give courage and a sense of duty and of justice 
to those in the world who bear great responsibility by virtue of the powers that have been given to them. And grant, we pray, a measure of peace. As we think, Lord, of our own land in these weeks running up to the election where our screens and airwaves and newspapers bombard us day by day, hour by hour, it seems, with electioneering. We pray, Lord, that you would remind us that there is no authority, no government in this world but by your hand. No authority exists except from God. And your word tells us that governors, rulers, even those with whom we disagree and even those who are deeply unpopular are ministers of God for our sakes. Help us, Lord, when we tend to cynicism and despair. Remind us to give thanks for the freedoms, for the peace, for the great and vast prosperity that we in this nation have known and continue to know despite all our complaints. None of us have had to take to boats and flee across the sea, risking death simply to preserve our lives. And so, Lord, give us perspective, we pray, in the grip of so-called economic calamity brought about, yes, by the folly and the fruitlessness of foolish policies in this nation and in many Western nations. Help us not to forget the great privileges that we know and continue to share. But have mercy on us, we do ask, O oh God, and grant us, we pray, rulers and governments better than that which we do deserve. We pray for the coming new parliament which will be elected, which seems to be the most uncertain prospect in recent memory, if not in living memory. We pray, Lord, above all, that you would give us in our parliament, in the House of Commons and indeed in the House of Lords, people of integrity and stature, not only of skill and experience, but of honesty and of truth, with a desire to serve and not be served, with a genuine sense of duty and care for the public and for our nation. We pray, Lord, for the so-called British values that we hear so much about today and ask that we would have a parliament that remembers that all that has made this nation great in the past has been Christian values, that our foundations upon which our institutions of government and state have been held firm and secure for centuries, our foundations firmly laid in the truth of the revelation of the one and only God in Jesus Christ our Lord. So, Lord, in a day when all such things are increasingly being consigned to the dustbin of history, we ask for a reawakening, an opening of eyes, an understanding that as our leaders look to all the things in our society that are disintegrating in ways that we find so painful and difficult, they would understand that it is when you erode foundations which are so essential to all building that will last, that the superstructures of things that we think are beautiful and lovely to behold begin also to crumble and be destroyed. So, Lord, we cry to you for our nation, for our peoples, for our communities, for our loved ones, for our neighbors with whom we live. We pray that you would give us a society that makes for peace, that enables good government, and that helps us to have the freedom to proclaim to one and all the truth that alone will change not only this world, but will lead into the world that is to come. 
the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Above all, Heavenly Father, we pray of this next government that we are to have, that it would preserve peace and freedom to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in these islands, that men and women of whatever origin would come here and hear the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thinking of that, Lord, we thank you for our many brothers and sisters from the land of Iran that have come and found fellowship here with us in this church, and many of them have found eternal life in Jesus Christ. We pray for some 50 of them all away this weekend in Pitlochry with the leaders of our international Bible studies. And we pray, Lord, that that would be a time of great fellowship and joy for them, friendship together, enjoyment of one another's company, but above all, a sharing in the grace that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. For those, Lord, who have gone who don't yet know you, <clears throat> we pray that this weekend might be pivotal in their lives that through what is shared of the gospel and what is shared in the living witness of Christian brothers and sisters, that they would find and come to know and love and cherish the Lord Jesus and his salvation. And so, Lord, for every one of us, we pray this morning, whether we be from north or south or east or west, would you open our eyes and our hearts to the glory that is in Jesus Christ alone. And so as we come now with reverence and with awe to your word, we pray that you would open it to our hearts and open our hearts to you. For we ask it in Jesus Christ, our Savior's name. Amen. And so we sing the hymn on the screens. Now in reverence and awe, we gather round your word.
Well, let's turn, shall we, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, page 873 in our, uh, in our church Bibles. As I said, our opening verse, verse 22, reminds us that Jesus is on a journey. And uh, all the way along, he's teaching his followers vital things. Uh, and this verse begins, as I said, the next section in Luke's Gospel, which runs through to chapter 17, verse 11, where we have another one of those little indicators that he's on the road to Jerusalem. But of course, Jesus is journeying not only to Jerusalem. In chapter 9, verse 51, uh, we're told he began to set his face towards Jerusalem. It was because the time drew near for him to be taken up that is, taken up to heaven's glory. That's where the journey ends, the very last couple of verses of Luke's gospel, Jesus taken up uh, to the glory of heaven. So for Jesus, that is the journey he is on, to the glory of heaven. But that journey must be through Jerusalem. It's a journey that must go via the cross. And that's why Jesus says back in chapter 9 that anyone who follows me, if anyone would come after me to that glory, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So from chapter 9, verse 51, Jesus is teaching his disciples then and now what it means to walk the road to glory with him. And he's laid out what that path looks like. It is a way of privilege and of rejoicing, but it will also be a way of pain and rejection in this world. And we've seen in the last few chapters the priorities he lays out for all who will truly live in this world but for that glory to come. You'll value Jesus and his kingdom above all other earthly things. You'll seek a real relationship with him, responding to his call. Real repentance, bearing fruit in your life. Because that's what we were created for. Remember the story he told there of the fig tree last time. We're not created for barrenness, but for fruitfulness. Yes, God is patient, extraordinarily patient. He gives enormous opportunity for repentance and for bearing fruit, but not forever. Remember chapter 13, verse 9. In the end... There comes a time when time is gone, and the fruitless fig tree must be cut down. And so Jesus repeatedly warns, doesn't he? Unless you repent, you also will perish. Now, it's solemn talk. But here in the next section, that urgent tone also continues, even as the events focus more now on the future than on the present. Jesus is turning to the perfection of his coming kingdom in glory. And, uh, and that's why the dominant theme through these next few chapters is feasting. It's all about the sumptuous banquet that represents the ultimate honor and, and joy and comfort of Christ's coming kingdom. And, as we saw in verse 29, it's wideness. It's extraordinarily inclusive, the kingdom of Jesus. People come from east and west and north and south to feast at the table of his glorious kingdom. So it's all about perfection, the coming perfection and the delight of great celebration in the kingdom of Christ. Hence, in chapter 14 that follows, we have the parable of the banquet. And then in chapter 15, there's a great celebration and feasting that follows when the lost is found, the lost coin, the lost sheep, and above all, the lost son. And then in chapter 16, there's the story of the poor man and Lazarus. Poor Lazarus, starving in this life, but at last comforted wonderfully at the side of Abraham in the kingdom. Wonderful feasting. And yet, there is also great sadness, because in each one of these cases, some miss out on the perfection of the glory to come. Either unconsciously, as in the first and the final stories, like the people here in chapter 13, or the rich man in chapter 16, who through presumption neglect the call of Christ on their lives. Or, as in the middle two stories, it's much more consciously those who are invited to the banquet and refuse, or the elder brother who refuses to enter, who purposefully reject the call of Christ on their lives. 
And Jesus' teaching is very clear all the way through these uh, stories. There are two and only two possible destinations for eternity. Either there is perfection and everlasting gain, or there is perdition, everlasting loss. And his repeated warning is not to miss out on his coming kingdom of perfection, of honor and joy and comfort, whose bounds are wide enough to encompass every tribe and language and people and nation. Don't miss out either through unconsciously but presumptuously neglecting Jesus' call or through consciously and purposely rejecting Jesus' call on your life. And right here in our passage today, we have the first movement of this new section of teaching. And we hear this warning very clearly indeed. Verses 22 to the end of chapter 13 focus on the perfect wideness of Christ's glorious kingdom that is to come. But the message is loud and clear. Don't neglect God's grace in Jesus Christ presumptuously. You must strive to enter now by responding to the exclusive call of Christ, the one who alone comes in the name of the Lord as this world's Savior. And you must do so, says Jesus, before the exclusive door of entry becomes for you an excluding door of exit from God's coming kingdom. Well, you see the passage falls into two paragraphs, so let's look first at verses 22 to 30, which are all about wideness and weeping. Jesus says there will be painful weeping for some, despite the perfect wideness of Christ's coming kingdom of glory. Verse 28, though people come from east and west and north and south to join the joy, some will weep bitterly. You will see yourselves cast out, says Jesus. Now, Jesus' words here are precipitated, you'll see, by the question in verse 23, Lord, will those who are saved be few? We don't know uh, the motivation for that question. We don't know whether it was Jesus' radical talk about uh, priorities for all who follow him that made people wonder, well, who could possibly follow that road? Or maybe it was just the kind of speculative theoretical question that people often ask, usually as a way of sidestepping the challenge of the gospel. It certainly does seem strange, doesn't it, to assume, as this man seems to, that few will be saved when in the verse going before it, Jesus only just talked about his kingdom as being like a vast tree that will provide nesting places for all the birds of the earth, or like leaven which proceeds through all the loaf until the whole thing is leavened. It's a picture of vastness and wideness, isn't it? But you see, people very often do ignore what the Bible is really saying, don't they? And they ignore the questions that the Bible is really posing and like to focus instead on all kinds of questions that the Bible doesn't pose and doesn't answer. At any rate, Jesus doesn't give a direct answer to the question, but nevertheless, he gives a very clear answer. He exposes the questioner and he turns the tables. And he says to them, never mind that, never mind the hypotheticals. What about you? Will you be saved? That's the real question. It's like when somebody asks the question, well, what about the, what about the unreached tribes in the Amazon rainforest who have never heard the gospel, have never had opportunity? What will happen to them? And Jesus says, never mind them. What about you who do have opportunity right now? That's the real question. You all have responsibility to enter the kingdom, says Jesus. No one can presume and therefore neglect the call of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus himself says in verse 24, do you see, some will be excluded. Many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When they finally realize that they need to, for some in fact, it's Jesus who says, for many, they'll find the door shut. It's the master, verse 25, who controls the door, not you. And when it's shut, it's too late. You can no longer enter in, not ever. Now, for some, 
such as King Herod, as we'll see in a moment in verse 32. For some, that door of opportunity may be closed even when we're still living. But for all, it'll certainly close when the Master returns to call us to account, either on the last day or if we die before that, like the rich fool in chapter 12. Do you remember? Tonight, your soul will be required of you. And Jesus can hardly be plainer here. We can't avoid it. There is such a thing as finding the door of his kingdom closed upon you forever. That's what he's saying. Not so the bishop that I heard the other week on the Today program. Some of you perhaps heard him speaking about the uh, reburial of the notorious King Richard III in Leicester Cathedral. He didn't seem to think that because when he was asked by John uh, Humphreys or whoever it was, uh, whether it was right that a, a king with such a wicked reputation, if it really was true, that if he really was as wicked and as godless as everyone said, that we should be treated as a, 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 a saint in a new Christian burial. And the bishop said, well, of course, he's forgiven now, as we all will be. In other words, according to the bishop, whether you strive to enter through the exclusive door of forgiveness through repentance in Jesus' name, or whether you don't, is of no matter at all, because it'll all be the same in the end. But I'm afraid, Mr. Bishop, the Lord Jesus Christ says, not so. Many will seek to enter, and they will not be able, says Jesus, because the master of the house, God himself, will at last shut that door. And even great ones, like the wealthy farmer of chapter 12, or King Richard, or any other king may hear God say, you fool, this night your soul is required of you. And notice verse 26, you see, there will be for some on that day great perplexity, great perplexity. You see, they claim to know Jesus. They claim to have a claim on him. We ate and drank in your presence. You taught in our streets. They may know Jesus socially, but they don't know him spiritually. And that is the only thing that really matters, according to Jesus. They weren't like Mary back in chapter 10, do you remember, who sat at Jesus' feet and let his word direct her life. My true family, says Jesus, are those who hear the word of God and do it. See, it's not familiarity with Jesus that counts. It's real faith in Jesus. It's not even family connection with God's people that counts. Connection with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets of the kingdom, verse 28. No, it's faith. It's entering personally by the narrow door, the exclusive way and truth and life that is Jesus Christ the Savior himself. And Jesus says that some people will be shocked, surprised, perplexed, and even protesting their exclusion. But friends, we need to be very clear if Jesus is to be believed. It's not being around Jesus and his people, around the church, even involved in the church. It's not that that counts. In Matthew 7, verse 22, Jesus is even more explicit. It's not even being involved in ministry in Christ's church that counts. Prophesying, doing mighty works in his name. Jesus can still say to such people, I never knew you. Nor is it being born and baptized into the privileges or heritage of God's people. Inheriting the nurture and admonition of the Scriptures and the blessings of the church, which are many and great blessings. Don't be mistaken. But these great blessings confer very great responsibilities. And these things are to propel you to enter through the narrow door, to respond to the grace of God in Jesus Christ, the Savior. And when Jesus says to strive, of course, he doesn't mean it's a matter of religious zeal or merit or good works. Of course, he doesn't. Strive simply means to make an absolute priority, to ask, to seek, to knock, so that he will give you what he has promised. He will open you will receive. He will give His Holy Spirit to everyone who asks. We read that, haven't we, just a couple of weeks ago in chapter 10. 
But you must ask, because there comes a time when it will be too late to presume upon God's Spirit, to neglect the call of Jesus persistently is, according to Jesus, to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And Jesus was clear about that, wasn't he, in chapter 12, verse 10. That cannot, in the end, be forgiven. And it must lead tragically to the response of verse 27 here. Depart from me, you workers of evil. You can't presume and just neglect the call of the Lord Jesus. If you do, Jesus himself says, great perplexity will then turn, verse 28, to great pain, weeping, gnashing of teeth. What's described here in verses 28 and 29 is the pain of irreparable loss. Not only, says Jesus, will there be will there be terrible deprivation, there'll be the added agony of a conscious perception of what is forfeited and what otherwise could have been. You will see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets of the kingdom of God and multitudes from every nation, north, south, east, and west, but you yourselves cast out, weeping and gnashing of teeth, conscious frustration, and regret, and horror, and agony of a deprivation that is monumental and ongoing and without end. Make no mistake, be in no doubt about it. All through the Gospels where you read Jesus using this imagery of weeping and gnashing of teeth, he uses it consistently alongside speaking about outer darkness about the fiery furnace of the worm that does not end, of the everlasting fire of eternal punishment. And a great part of that punishment described here is the never-ending conscious torment of knowing what could have been, but what you, by your personal failure, have denied yourself and instead created for yourself something unimaginably terrible to live with forever. Have you ever discovered that you've made a mistake, an error, a terrible misjudgment, something that has resulted in, in dreadful consequences, things that you have to live with, something that torments you for the rest of your life? Like the person, you know, who leaves the gas on and goes out and suddenly remembers and rushes home and discover, well, it's too late. The, the house has burnt down. There's been a huge gas explosion. Or the doctor who gives the wrong drug or maybe the wrong dose of drug to a patient and it kills them and they have to live with that. Or the mother who leaves the brake of the pram off when she's chatting to somebody in the street and turns around and sees the pram careering down the hill and heading for a lorry and then crumpled and crushed underneath the lorry. Imagine how terrible the torment of living with something like that for the rest of your life. And how much worse if you've been repeatedly warned by people not to be careless, not to do these things, lest you live to regret it. But you've just done it anyway. Imagine all of these things and a hundred thousand others worse beside. And imagine a never-ending eternity of these things replaying before you again and again and again in a never-ending present with no dulling by the passage of time. That's what Jesus is saying here will be absolute hell, and a never-ending reminder of your absolute folly and perversity in choosing that, choosing to be excluded from rescue from that into the perfect joy and comfort and honor and delight that you see others experiencing. That is what it will be for some, says Jesus here. 
And you'll see, as verse 30 says, there is also in that great pain a great paradox. Some who seem most likely in the world's eyes to be honored guests in heaven, if there is a heaven, will be quite absent. Whereas some whom the world hasn't even noticed their existence will be guests at the honored table of God himself. Some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Some with all the privileges of upbringing, of, of spiritual heritage, of great opportunity will not be where they ought to be in the kingdom of glory. There's a word for every young person born and growing up in this church fellowship with all the privileges that you have. Because it's not by family or familiarity with Jesus, but by faith that you enter exclusively through faith in Jesus Christ. It's a narrow door, says Jesus, that gives entrance into a kingdom of perfect wideness. And according to Jesus, it is a closing door, which ultimately, if not entered into in the day of opportunity, will be closed, make no mistake. One day, that exclusive door will become an excluding door. And some are first, who will be last, and lost forever. But some, says Jesus, are last now and will be found, and found forever, even though they had no privileges in life, only privations. They'll be welcomed from east and west and north and south to feast at the king's table because the grace of God is the great leveler. And the sovereign mercy of God is the great lifter. I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion upon whom I will have compassion. Even the very lowest, even the very least to deserve it. God is a God of sovereign grace and love abounding over sin and death and hell. And there is a wideness in God's mercy that is wider than the greatest sea. And some who are very last and last in line to deserve one iota of God's mercy will be elevated beyond their wildest expectations to a place at the table of the king. But you see, lest any of us should think that in any way God's sovereignty is capricious or unjust. This next paragraph here in Jesus' teaching is very clear and very, very important. If there shall be, as Jesus says there shall be, painful weeping for some, despite the perfect wideness of his kingdom of grace and mercy, we must be very clear. The fault in that is not God's, not God's. God will exclude no one who does not freely and willfully also exclude themselves from his saving grace. You see, verses 31 to 35 are all about willingness and willfulness. And again, Jesus is absolutely plain. It is perverse and willful rejection of a persistently willing Redeemer that results in the awful judgment of a sovereign God. Verse 34, how often would I have gathered your children, but you would not. See, in, these, in these solemn words here that follow, Jesus is applying the parable that he's just told directly into real life to his immediate hearers in his own generation. Both an individual, Herod, one of the first in the land, who Jesus dismisses with contempt as last, and also to Israel as a whole, to a privileged nation, a most favored generation, familiar with Jesus for certain, but with no faith in Jesus for the most part. A people who exalted their house, the temple, but who scorned God's words and his true messengers always, and who were therefore forsaken by Jesus. The door was shut upon them because they would not recognize and enter the door of saving mercy that it was extended to them. When it came to them in the person of the Son of God seeking to woo them 
into eternal life. And Jesus' words here in verse 32 to Herod are, first of all, words of real solemnity. Here is an example in the flesh of a man for whom the door of opportunity has already been slammed shut by Jesus himself, and to whom Jesus is saying, even now in these words, I don't know where you have come from. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. See, he's dismissing him with contempt in verse 32. Herod had many privileges, many opportunities. He was a king of Israel. He had scribes and teachers of the law and priests galore in his court. More than that, back in Luke chapter 3, do you remember? He had John the Baptist himself come to him and proclaim the gospel to him personally. Jesus says John is the greatest prophet who has ever lived, and he came personally to this man and proclaimed the salvation of the kingdom of God. But Herod didn't want John's message because he didn't like John's message because John called him to repent of his evil ways. Not least of his sexual behavior, which John dared to say was sinful and therefore must be repented of and changed. So Herod imprisoned John and later killed him. The outraged reaction to calling sinful and perverted sex wrong is not a new thing. It's not new in our generation. That God should, should dare to tell human beings how to enjoy the gift of sex in the way he has planned for it to be. That outrages people. It always has, and it still does today. And people will still try to silence those who talk in that way, just as they will try to silence us. Look at Elton John's ridiculous outburst a few weeks ago against Dolce & Gabbana. How pathetic and sad. But prominent people, and powerful people especially, will not tolerate that sort of criticism. And where they can, they'll respond with vehemence and indeed even with violence. And some of us, friends, will, will face that in our society today. It's inevitable. Look at Chalmers Church in Edinburgh just a few weeks ago and the aggressive opposition they faced from the LGBT brigade. But that was Herod. Herod rejected John willfully. And in doing so, he willfully rejected the one that John proclaimed. And in Luke chapter 9, we're told later, when Herod heard about Jesus, after he had killed John, he was perplexed, and he sought to see Jesus. But Jesus did not engage Herod or indulge him. And his words here are very dismissive. In fact, they're withering Go and tell that fox. Jesus is full of scorn for this man. He's a king of Israel, but he's no lion of Judah. He's just a fox. A destructive vermin. Neither great nor straight. And Jesus dismisses him as one who may seem to be first, but who will be last on any measure that counts, that really matters in the end. They're withering words. They're very solemn and chilling. Later, in chapter 23, we read that Herod, when Jesus was brought before him, was glad and wanted to hear what he had to say and wanted to see some kind of sign from him and questioned him at length. But Luke records there for us the fateful words, but Jesus made him no answer. King Herod is met by Jesus only with scorn here and with silence on the day he comes before him face to face. Because already for this man, it's too late. The door of opportunity has closed. He willfully and persistently has resisted God's Word and His challenging call to repent through the Scriptures that he's had all his life, through the prophets who have come to him and been sent to him through the evangelist, come right before him. And in doing so, he has willfully rejected God himself because he had rejected God totally in his heart. And so when Jesus later stands before him and wouldn't dance to his tune, it's no surprise that we read at Jesus' trial that he just gives vent to what his heart had always been saying right from the very beginning. He joins in with his common soldiers, and we're told he treated Jesus with contempt and mocked him. 
And on that day, he and Pilate became friends. He became friends with the man who could kill Jesus for him. All because for a very, very long time, he had willfully rejected the real Jesus because he wouldn't stoop and humble himself and enter through the narrow door of penitent faith. That is the only door. Because he wouldn't find forgiveness. That even kings and great ones must find, if ever there, to have a place in the only kingdom that will ever last, the only kingdom that counts. And sadly and tragically, long before that fateful day, when he met Jesus face to face, the door had been closed for him. The door had stood open and inviting, but now it must be closed. And friends, that is the tragic story, isn't it, of many a great man in this world. First, in his life, in his career, in his business, in his profession, in his reputation, in his sport, in everything else. Too big, though, too full of self to humble himself, to enter, to strive to enter such a narrow door. No narrow religious extremism for me. One day they'll discover that there only was one door that mattered. And that door is now shut forever from the inside. And even the master key of the kind of man whose money and wealth and power and position seems to unlock every door in life that they ever want to unlock, even that master key that they have in their hand won't do anything in the one door that really matters. It's a word of real solemnity that Jesus speaks here. We need to listen. It's also, though, a word about real sovereignty. Jesus is saying to Herod here, you may be king, but you don't rule me. I'll finish my course. Verse 23, he's saying, I'll do it my way. I must go on my way. And I choose how and where and why I give up my life. I must go and perish at Jerusalem, he says. Must. We've seen it again and again, haven't we? It's one of those words all the way through Luke's Gospel and Acts. Again and again, Jesus tells his followers that he sees his death coming that it is according to God's sovereign plan and purpose, not only planned, but published and prophesied in the Scriptures right from the beginning. The Son of Man must suffer and be rejected by this generation, chapter 17, verse 25. The Scripture must be fulfilled in me. He was humbled with the transgressors, chapter 22, verse 37. Everything written about me in the law and the prophets must be fulfilled again and again, chapter 24, after his resurrection, and many, many other places too. His was a mission sovereignly planned and executed. None of this is outside God's sovereign design and perfect plan. None, even a king like Herod, could possibly derail it. None of it is second best not Christ's terrible death on the cross. However hard it is for us to understand how that must be and how could that be part of such a perfect plan of salvation that the Son of God should die. But it's not second best. Nor is the exclusion from Christ's eternal kingdom those who reject the Savior. However hard it is for us to understand how that could possibly be part of a perfect plan of a loving God, which seems such an apparent tragedy to us. But it is God's plan. It may be a great shock to many on that day and great perplexity at their exclusion. But Jesus is clear it will not be a surprise and a shock to God. That's something both Jesus and his apostles are absolutely at one about. Jesus is utterly plain in his teaching here. We can't avoid it, can we? Just as Paul is in Ephesians chapter 1, where he tells us about God's predestinating grace before the foundation of the world, willing the adoption through Jesus Christ of his own. So 
to the praise of his glorious grace and his grace alone. Just as Peter is equally plain in 1 Peter chapter 2 about those who stumble in Christ. They stumble, he says, because they disobey as they were destined to do. The wideness of the scope of the Savior's eternal glory is perfect. It is as God has sovereignly purposed in Christ that it must be. There will be no surprises for God in his kingdom. He is the door, and he is the doorkeeper. But that does not for one moment mean that his judgments on those who are excluded from the kingdom are in any way unjust or undeserved. It's quite the reverse. And that's why Jesus says here, it must be Jerusalem where he would perish at the hands of those who, who for countless generations have been at the very center of God's gracious attention. To whom verse 34 says, they have, he had sent prophets and saviors all throughout their history and yet they had willfully refused and rejected them all, all the representatives of the sovereign majesty of God. God is utterly sovereign over his world, and because he is sovereign, when his sovereign command is rejected and resisted, only terrible judgment and loss can possibly ensue. And Jesus says that is loss that leads to everlasting pain and sorrow. And that's what these last two verses speak of, is it not? Words of real sorrow, both the tragic sorrow of loss for those forsaken by God, but also the very real sorrow in the heart of God Himself, for whom judgment is a strange work, and not ever, ever, ever something He delights in. Jesus speaks here of the heart of God. And out of the heart of God, of centuries of unrequited love as He showered His love and mercy upon His people, how often would I, He says, how often He had sent prophets and saviors to them, and yet they stoned them, they killed them, and in doing so spat in His face. How often Read through Stephen's great speech in Acts chapter 7 and how he says to the people how God sent them Joseph to be a savior in Egypt and they rejected him. And God sent them Moses to be a savior to bring them out of Egypt and they turned and scorned and rejected him and all through their history to David and Solomon and all the prophets. Always you resist the Holy Spirit of God himself, says Stephen. And then true to form, they stoned Stephen, too. So how can there be anything but judgment? Not just now exile to Babylon for a time for Israel, but according to Jesus, exile to outer darkness and destruction, to weeping and gnashing of teeth for eternity. Behold your house, verse 35, the temple that they idolized, but rejected and hated the Lord of the temple. Your house is forsaken. There'll be devastation, just as the prophets spoke of. He's quoting here the words of Jeremiah from chapter 12 and chapter 22, but this time far more devastating, far more final. And he pronounces what must surely now take place for this generation, so utterly privileged, yet which turns out to be the epitome of an evil, God-hating people. When you come to Luke 19, verse 41, Jesus again says the same things, this time weeping physically over Jerusalem. And he foretells the total destruction of the city along with the temple, just as it did happen a few decades later in AD 70 under the Romans. And all because, Jesus said, you did not recognize the very one sent to bring you peace. And now, says Jesus, these things are hidden from your eyes. The door is closed because repeatedly they would not 
In the end, Jesus says, they could not. They couldn't recognize and receive their salvation. God withdraws his grace and mercy. He shuts the door of escape. He does it. He shuts the door. But Jesus is clear. They have absolutely brought it upon themselves. It's truly and certainly a self-inflicted sorrow of eternal proportions. Friends, we really need to understand this. The Bible is absolutely clear. God is a sovereign God. He and He alone calls into eternal life. But it is equally clear. There will be none in hell who didn't freely choose that destiny for themselves either by presumptuously neglecting or by purposefully rejecting the call of Jesus Christ. The sovereign God is willing. How often would I? He has promised His Holy Spirit of life to everyone who will ask and seek and knock. Everyone! But some, says Jesus, indeed many, He says, will not you you would not. Willful rejection, whether it seems unconscious or indeed whether we are fully conscious of what we're doing. And in the end, if we persistently signal to God that we want you out of our lives, He will give us what we want and ask for. Look at verse 35. You will not see me because you don't want to see me. He'll only show himself to those who will welcome him as God's wonderful Savior and who will bless him as that, as the one who comes in the name of the Lord to bring salvation, whether it be individuals like Herod or indeed whether it be whole communities and nations and generations. That generation, says Jesus, had closed the door and it paid a terrible price, both in earthly judgment on the nation and for each one who rejected Christ, eternal judgment. Will it be so for every generation of natural Israelites, the descendants of Abraham according to the flesh, Jewish people? Well, according to Jesus, it certainly will until they welcome Jesus as the true Messiah. And unless they do, there can be no hope, none at all. Jesus says later on in Luke chapter 21, verse 14, that Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, whatever that might mean. Some people believe that there will be one day a great turning of Jews to the Lord Jesus Christ, a great day of salvation. Perhaps that may be so, perhaps. We must be careful, mustn't we? Paul says in Romans chapter 11, he says this, even as his heart yearns for his fellow countrymen rejecting the gospel, he says, even they, if, if they do not persist in their unbelief, will be grafted in, that is, to God's true vine. For God has the power to graft them in again. So will multitudes of Jews all over the world be saved on mass one day? Well, Paul says God has the power. So surely we must say, may it be so. May it be so. But it will only be, and it can only be, if multitudes respond to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and say, blessed be Jesus Christ, the Messiah sent from God to save us. It can't be any other way, can it? But you see, that kind of question is really rather like the question that began our passage in verse 22, isn't it? It's so easy to get sidetracked into speculation about these kind of things, but Jesus always turns the spotlight once again, not out there, but in here, to each one of us now today, not the nation of Israel or the Jews of the world or anybody else. 
In fact, that is actually what Paul does also in Romans chapter 11. What he says in saying those things to, is this, note the kindness and severity of God. They, the Jews, were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand by faith. So you who I'm talking to, do not become proud, but stand in awe. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. You see what he's saying? We may have all kinds of questions, speculative questions for Jesus about who will be saved and how many and when and where and how and Jews and Gentiles and all kinds of things. But Jesus turns to every one of us this morning and says, don't be asking the question, will the saved be few? Be asking the question, will the saved be you? Make sure that you strive to enter the narrow door before Jesus Christ, who is himself the exclusive door of entry, a willing Savior. Strive to enter before he must become the excluding door of the just and righteous judge who must eject you ultimately from everlasting life if you refuse to enter that door to his great sorrow and to your eternal sorrow and loss. Strive to enter through the narrow door for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may we heed these words of warning, but take them for what they are, words of wooing and willing grace and mercy calling us to be yours, urging us to ask, seek, and knock, and telling us that you are willing and you will give your Holy Spirit who brings eternal life in Jesus' name to every one who will enter through the door now. So, Lord, may that be so for everyone here this day to the praise of your glorious grace. Amen. Well, we're going to end by singing number 963. And here's a question to help us reflect on these words of Jesus. When you, my righteous judge, shall come to fetch your ransom people home, shall I among them stand? 963.
And so may that grace, sovereign grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.